Exnilo's web hosting technical expertise service and 20 years of experience helped to enable over 500,000 website owners grow their businesses. Go to exnilo.co.za today to open your business to the world. Exnilo, trusted in hosting. I'm Duncan McLeod and this is Tech Central. I'm very pleased to welcome not one, not two, but three top-notch guests to the podcast now to unpack communications regulator ICASA's planned Spectrum auction and the licensing of the so-called Wholesale Open Access Network, or WOAN. ICASA last week, of course, published two invitations to apply, or ITAs. Uh, One of those was for participating in the Spectrum auction, which was going to happen before the end of March 2021, and the other is for the licensing of the WOAN. Um, Now, to unpack those two ITAs, um, and especially the ITA on Spectrum, I'd like to welcome Steve Song, Mortimer Hope and Karen Edmondson to the podcast. Uh, by way of very quick introduction, I'm going to start with Karen. Karen Edmondson is a qualified attorney with legal advisory experience across 25 markets. She specializes in ICT law and clients have included the likes of Internet Solutions, Virgin Mobile, Celsi, and of course, ICASA. She has acted in an advisory capacity to the IMF and the World Bank and has worked on a number of government projects. Uh, Karen, thanks for making the time and welcome to Tech Central. Thanks very much, Duncan. Now, Mortimer Hope is MD of a company called GH Communications, um, which provides consultancy services to support policymakers, regulators, and service providers and operators in the ICT environment. Uh, He was previously director for Africa at the GSMA, the big global mobile industry body, and has held senior positions at Vodacom as well as ICASA. Uh, Mortimer is participating in a consortium that plans to uh, bid for the WOAN license, so he will not participate when we get to that part of the discussion today, but he is going to participate fully in our discussion today on the Spectrum ITA. Mortimer, thanks so much for joining us. I believe you are in Guyana in Latin America at the moment. Yes, thanks very much. It's um, it's a pleasure being with you today, and I am in Guyana. Great stuff. Well, we've got a we've got an international uh, panel today because our next guest is in Canada, in North America, and that is Steve Song, who probably doesn't need much by way of introduction to Tech Central's audience. Um, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, Steve describes himself, according to his blog, Many Possibilities, as a jack of all trades in the world of affordable access to communications infrastructure. He is currently a half-time fellow in residence at the Mozilla Foundation, uh, which uh, makes me suspect he uses the Firefox web browser as his primary uh, means of connecting to the internet. Uh, He also works on policy and regulation issues for the Association for Progressive Communications. Uh, It's a community network support project, and he is research director with the Network Startup Resource Center, or NSRC. He is also a former fellow of the uh, Shuttleworth Foundation, created, of course, by the South African billionaire, internet billionaire, Mark Shuttleworth. Uh, Steve is possibly most famous for his map of internet cables connecting Africa, which uh, has changed Steve quite dramatically over the past uh, 10 years for the positive. Thanks so much for uh, for joining us all the way from Canada today. Steve, welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much, Duncan. Yeah, I didn't, I uh, must say, I didn't expect to uh, become most famous for that map, but, you know, <laughs> I'm uh, happy to see it's popular. I've, well, I've, I've seen the probably uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, PowerPoint presentations over the years referencing that map, <laughs> Steve. <laughs> you're already very well known for it. Um, but uh, we've got three people, as you can hear, with great experience of the telecommunications sector and uh, well qualified to unpack the two ICASA ITAs on the show today. So um, the, the only question, I guess, is uh, where do we start? Um, I thought uh, maybe a good starting point would be to ask all three of you uh, in very general terms and, and, and fairly briefly in, in, a, in a sort of a couple of minutes uh, to um, give us a helicopter view, your take on the Spectrum ITA specifically. Um, Karen, let me pick on you first. What's your, what's your sort of high level view of this ITA? Is it, uh, is it well drafted? Duncan, it's a bit concerning. So to answer your first question, unfortunately, I have to say no. Um, There's a number of definitions in the document that are introduced out of the blue, so to speak. 
So we've not seen them before in the regulatory framework, and yet the consequences of those definitions are really quite significant. So definitions such as tier one and tier two, ECAS is purporting to divide the market, I think, on a competitor level between large and small operators, which is an odd thing to do because you would generally want to level the playing fields. And they do suggest that they are promoting or attempting to promote competition through this ITA and through the award of spectrum, particularly they say because they spectrum flaws and you need to obtain a minimum spectrum portfolio. And then there are spectrum caps. So operators that already have spectrum are going to be subject to um, a cap on how much more they can obtain. So from a drafting point of view, I think there are some very confusing, in addition to these new regulatory um, things and, and a slightly odd approach to competition, there are a number of um, somewhat contradictory or perhaps they're just unclear or perhaps I need to read it once more, but there are a number of unclear uh, provisions in the document. Um, a number of them, for example, relate to these uh, portfolios that have also been introduced as a new term, the portfolio one and portfolio two. Um, a couple refer to whether or not you're a wholesale national operator or a sub-national operator. I'm not too sure how that ties in. And then I think there's some confusion about the opt-in nature um, of some of the um, rules, whether or not you have spectrum already, you're allowed to opt in at a certain point in the auction. So I haven't actually um, run a sort of mock auction based on these rules, but my overall impression is that there could be a few clarification questions that would be beneficial if ICASA could address. All right. I mean, is, are, the, are, there, are, are there sufficient concerns here that uh, we could see possible litigation against this ITA? I don't think anyone would want to litigate it because they're so keen to get their hands on the spectrum and it's obviously become a, a real national priority for that to happen. So I don't know that anybody would litigate, but it's possible that if a bidder were to bid and not receive spectrum, hmm. they might then litigate after the process on the basis that it wasn't fairly designed or it didn't proceed in a manner that was fair and reasonable. So you'd like to see some sort of explanatory document coming up, perhaps to explain some of the terms in the ITA? I think it would be wise for ECASA to accept clarification questions. There isn't currently a provision for that in the document, mm -hmm. but I think it might be wise for them to issue some guidance notes based on people's concerns or questions. Um, unless I'm the only one who has concerns or questions, in which case everyone can carry on as before. <laughs> well, let's throw it over to Mortimer and then and, uh, and get his take on this. So what's your view of the ITA and do you uh, share similar concerns to Karen? Well, firstly, I think CASA should be congratulated on getting the ITAs out. This has been a long time coming and we've had several delays, some not of CASA's doing. But still, it's 10 years and we finally have an ITA. And I agree with Karen that I don't think there would be litigation now because everyone wants the spectrum. Now, having said that, we look at the actual spectrum that is available. There was some in the consultations, the previous consultations, we had the 2.3 gigahertz band that seems to have fallen off the table. And there, I couldn't find an explanation of why it's not included here. So yes, I think ICASA has done well by publishing the ITAs, but they needed to publish some sort of document explaining an explanatory document, explaining their decisions. Mm. And there are some issues that need clarification in the ITAs, in the two ITAs, and there should have been provision made for that. I'm hoping that if sufficient number of people respond to ICASA seeking clarification, then they will publish an erratum just clarifying those issues that have been raised. One of the issues, by the way, is the disconnect between the two ITAs 
in terms of the number of years that that 30% of the capacity of the wound capacity must be taken up by the winning IMT spectrum bidders. Mm -hmm. In the IMT ITA, it says five years. In the spectrum, in the WON ITA, it says seven years. So there is a conflict there. Yeah. So that's something ICASA would need to address quickly. All right. Erata, so, erratum or, a, or some sort of explanatory document, as Kieran mentioned, sounds like it's going to be needed. But Steve, let me bring you in here. What's your helicopter take on this uh, on the spectrum ITA specifically? Um, do you think ICASA generally has done a good job with this? Um, I think, uh, you know, as Mortimer said, they are to be congratulated. It's been an incredibly long process of 10 years of, of, of you know, various uh, uh, interventions that have, um, you know, moved forward and then moved backward the process. So, you know, I have huge amounts of empathy for anyone who is in this position. I think the, the problem that comes of waiting 10 years is bundling er everything up together. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and in this case, I think the, in some ways, the enemy here is complexity um, in that, you know, if you, uh, you know, if you go to the doctor and you, uh, and you say, you know, um, uh, I'm not feeling well. And the doctor says, Oh, well, you need, uh, you need to take something for your blood pressure and we'll give you something for, uh, you know, your headache and, and you come home with six prescriptions, um, you might start to feel better, but, uh, but how would you know, but, you know, which, which uh, is the intervention that really made a difference. And also, you know, are some of these medications, you know, interfering with each other. And I think that's the danger we see here in the, in the complexity of, of the auction is that um, it's very, very hard to predict how the combination of uh, licenses, coverage obligations, and the WOAN, and um, uh, the uh, you know uh, various conditions, all are going to play out together. I think from a regulatory perspective, you know, um, it um, it's going to put ICASA in a difficult position in the future because you know you can it, it's possible to claim anything. Um, and, and it will be difficult to attribute it to one specific intervention. That's my, that's my sort of overall view. And then at a very specific level, I'm 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 concerned about about the way uh, the the coverage obligations have been architected and the provisions for spectrum sharing uh, in in the document, which you know mandate a, a minimum of five years uh, f uh, before spectrum sharing can happen in the. Uh, ITA, and then for the WOA, and it's seven years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, well, let's, uh, thanks, thanks everyone for, the, for those introductions and setting the scene. Uh, I'd like to actually, let me just see if I can do this. I'd like to put a, a graphic on the screen now, which shows the, um, should be displaying now, it shows the, um, straight out of the ACASA document, showing the, uh, the, the lots and the frequencies uh, that ACASA is putting up for auction, as well as the reserve prices associated with each of those lots. Um, Steve, let me let me st uh, stay with you just for the moment. Um, this is quite a change in the way ACASA is dividing up the spectrum compared to the draft ITA that we saw previously. Um, do you think this is the right approach to have many small lots up for grabs like this, or do you think it's going to uh, potentially distort the spectrum? Um, well, it, it's uh, it's important to talk about um, them individually. I think um, the advantage, for instance, in the case of seven and eight hundred megahertz of having two by five megahertz slots, is it offers uh, smaller operators some flexibility in that um, you know if you are building smaller sites, it's conceivable that two by five megahertz would be enough for. Uh, a small, a smaller deployments for the larger operators. Realistically, nobody's going to settle for less than 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 two by ten megahertz of spectrum. So there is this. Uh, I mean, there. I, I think there is a, an expectation that there will be some flexibility in in bidding. Um, uh, so you know, I don't, I, uh, I, I don't think it's a particularly bad thing uh, to to have the smaller lots. It does, it does create more more bidding options options potentially. Um, I am curious about um, uh, twenty six hundred megahertz in that it seems to be all TDD spectrum. Uh, you know, the, as opposed to um, FDD uh, paired spectrum, and I. 
I'd be interested in a in an explanation of of, of that decision of, of why they they opted to go in that direction. For those who don't um, follow the telecommunication sector closely, um, what is the significance of of uh, TDD versus FDD? Uh, well, um, so uh, in um, in FTD spectrum, you have a, a separate uplink and uh, and downlink band, and that's traditionally how most GSM bands have have been assigned. Um, it has um, uh, advantages in um, uh, in things like uh, in symmetric communication, like voice communication, in providing separate links uh, for that. Um, Increasingly, we see more TDD uh, spectrum, which is just a single band, um, and which does have some advantages in asymmetric communication, such as you know where we see with you know streaming media, where the vast majority of of, uh, of, of bandwidth is actually going down as opposed to going up. So, um, but usually, you know, often you'll see a mix uh, of those, uh, you know, uh, chosen by regulators to to allow for a bit of both. So it's interesting for me that uh, that they've gone with just what appear to have gone with just the the the, the one kind, which is uh, fourteen lots of ten megahertz each for for uh, TDD spectrum. Mm -hmm. I. Um, it, perhaps it's it's simply a more a more forward looking uh, approach. Interesting. Okay, and um, your your views on the three point five gigahertz band specifically? Um, well, again, uh, well, they have the you know these um, you know these two very unusual offerings of two megahertz and four megahertz. But I think you're absolutely right in that uh, the, uh, in your previous uh, suggestion um, offline that those those have been uh, set out there to fill out uh, existing assignments to uh, to telecom and. Um, Liquid, uh, liquid, and and liquid. So and and that makes sense. Um, and then offering the um, uh, uh, three point five gigahertz in um, TDD uh, again offerings, yeah, it seems like a sensible approach. So yeah, I I'm much less concerned with the um, two point six and three point five. Uh, gigahertz uh, offerings, both in terms of reserve prices and in terms of how they've been structured, than I am about the seven and eight hundred megahertz bands. Well, I, I want to delve into uh, the digital dividend bands, those seven hundred and eight hundred megahertz bands, uh, as part of a separate uh, discussion because um, we know about the digital migration issues. I want to tackle that with all of you, but Mortimer, let me bring you in here on the uh, lots um, uh, and ask the same question I asked of Steve. Um, do you think it makes sense the way Casa has divided these lots up into fairly small chunks of spectrum? Uh, and um, what, what is your take, very briefly, on each of the spectrum bands uh, that uh, have been made available? Yes, when you consider the lots and the the small size of the lots, I think what ICASA is trying to do is to encourage competition. So if we have more ECNS or infrastructure providers, the better. So having smaller lots, we, we could have more of these providers coming in. What is concerning though is, as Steve mentioned, the TDD in the 2.6 gigahertz band. And I would assume that ICASA consulted with the existing operators and that is their preference. That's why they decided to go completely TDD. Makes sense. Uh, yes. In terms of the, the digital dividend bands, it's the seven and 800 megahertz bands. The, Previously, one could argue that the 800 megahertz band would be more desirable because it became available earlier. But now I don't think there's much difference because both bands have been used in some parts of the world. The ecosystem is really well developed. So not much difference there. Although I think ICASA has priced the 700 megahertz band a bit less expensive than the 800 megahertz band. Maybe that's to reflect the ecosystem, the development of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. But overall, I'm happy with what they've done in terms of reserve pricing. I think they've taken into account the current economic situation mm -hmm. where if this was done five years ago, the pricing would have been higher, I assume. But now because of South Africa's economic 
circumstances and the COVID-19 pandemic, they've reduced the reserve prices, which I think is good. Yeah, yeah. Well, Karen, let's let's talk a bit about reserve prices. Um, looking at, at these, some of these numbers here on the screen, uh, it, it seems they are a bit they are a bit lower than the 2016 ITA that Ecasa put out, which was eventually scrapped. Um, what's your view on these reserve prices? Are they reasonable? Uh, Duncan, that's a tricky one. Reasonable in what context? Um, it's if you look at the 10 to 24 lot numbers, I mean, that's pretty, pretty high, I would have thought, per lot, 97 million. Um, but if you are Vodacom or MTN, and that's a lot you simply have to have, and it's going to make all the difference in the world to your efficiency and to the number of masts you're going to need to build, then that's probably something you've already factored into your, to your budget. Um, I think worldwide, people tend to regard reserves with some um, caution simply because if you're then going to bid above the reserve price, it's possible that you might have to pay more than what that spectrum would be worth um, in a sense. Uh, there's not really a benchmark for that, really. But the cost is likely then to be passed on to the consumer. That's the general feeling. Yeah. Because you're also going to then have to acquire equipment, acquire sites, roll out the network. There's going to be a lot of time and money involved. Um, and I think that those uh, reserve prices might just inflate the amount of the final price paid on auction, depending, of course, um, like on one to four, lots one to four. Those would also be highly priced and those are also extremely expensive. So... I think it's um, it's difficult to say whether they are in line with other countries. It's difficult to say, given our economy, whether those are reasonable in the circumstances. Um, I think that what will be telling is um, exactly how many people actually pay the 3 million rand non-refundable application fee and mm -hmm. indicate their intention to bid. I think we'll get a sense then of whether or not um, anybody is going to bid higher than what's available. Do you think do you think Ecasa designed these spectrum lots with specific operators in mind, expecting Vodacom, expecting MTN, expecting Telcom to bid on, on certain spectrum lots here, and that their expectation is that that's what's going to happen and the reserve price will be met and there isn't really going to be any uh, competition at the at the auction and price prices are not going to be driven up beyond these reserve prices? Yeah, that's my concern, actually, Duncan, because if you look at the 1 billion rand reserve price, I mean, there's no way a company like Cell C or Liquid um, could afford that. The question will whether Telcom could afford that and whether its balance sheet is sufficient to attract funding from anybody. So that is my concern because, as I understand the document, and of course it, it does bear reading numerous times, um, there is a reference to Tier 1 and Tier 2 operators, and ICASA seems to suggest that Tier 1 operators will largely be, will only be Vodacom and MTN. It's defining Tier 1 as operators with more than 45% of the retail market in more than 10 municipalities. And we know from ICASA's preliminary report on the broadband market inquiry that both MTN and Vodacom occupied what we would now call tier one spaces, um, and no other operator would qualify in that same way. Cell C, Telcom, Liquid, Rain, they don't have more than 45% of the retail market in, in more than 10 municipalities, uh, or certainly not to my knowledge. And it was an odd distinction because um, in the rest of the document, DeCars is only talking about wholesale. So it actually has other definitions um, in the document where it talks about national oper subnational operators, which provide wholesale um, services or um, services to more, less than 50% of the population. And it talks about wholesale national operators, which provide um, services to more than 50% of um, the population. So it's, I think that ICASA has envisaged in its own mind, and hence the spectrum caps and the spectrum flaws. And in fact, I think it's, um, is it clause? Yes, 6.2. 
it talks about the portfolios in the context of how many credible wholesale national operators will be left at the end of the day. So after the auction, ICASA actually says that it wants to have spectrum floors to ensure that the third and fourth national wholesale operators have enough spectrum to be credible competitors. So it's, it seems to me that they do envisage certain operators bidding only on certain lots. Mm -hmm. um, but I do wonder if that's either conducive to competition or going to maybe exclude some potential bidders altogether. Yeah. Do you, do you think that, um, I mean, we're calling this an auction. Do you think this is perhaps a traditional so-called beauty contest uh, model that's been dressed up as an auction? It's interesting because um, on my first read, my impression was, and I think there is wording to this, um, uh, to support this in the document, ICASA uses the word may, may proceed to the auction stage. So I don't know whether that was an error. Um, or whether it envisages maybe that if nobody intends bidding or participating in the bid and people say, I'll take this lot, I'm happy to pay the reserve price. Um, and there are only five entities really that one can envisage participating separately from the WOAN, then perhaps that's exactly what's going to happen. Mm. There won't be an auction, there'll simply be a payment. Yeah, interesting. Steve, um, you've had a look at the reserve prices, if, if we can really call them reserve prices. Um, may it be, and as Karen mentioned, it may be, end up being what everyone just pays at the end of the day. Um, what's your take on them? Um, I know you're a, a real advocate and have worked for many, many years on affordable communication access in Africa. Um, do you think South Africa is going in the right direction with this ITA with specific reference to the reserve prices that have been listed in the document? Um, yeah. Um, so when you, you know, when you calculate what you're going to bid uh, uh, for a license, you take into account three factors. Uh, one is the, uh, you know, the reserve price or what you're prepared to bid for the spectrum. Another is uh, the recurring annual fees uh, of the spectrum. And the third one is your coverage obligations and what the coverage obligations are going to cost you. Uh, so I'm, um, I'm, I'm more concerned about the coverage obligations than I am about the actual prices for the for the auction. Um, I think what we've seen across the continent um, is, first of all, the majority of regulators don't conduct auctions. They are auctions are still uh, the minority. Most of them are some kind of beauty contest, and the auctions that have been conducted uh, are, are not exactly littered with successes. So, you know, if we look at, you know, Ghana's auction of 800 megahertz, uh, there was, and which curiously had exactly the same reserve price as South Africa, uh, which is around $3 million per megahertz uh, for their uh, 800 megahertz auction. There was only one bidder, MTM, and mm -hmm. no one else could afford uh, the spectrum. Vodacom eventually came in and bought half the amount that, uh, that MTM did, but no one could call that auction a success. Um, Similarly, uh, you know, the auction in Tanzania, 700 megahertz in 2018, two lots, you know, arguably a success story, uh, two lots of spectrum going for around uh, uh, about a million dollars a megahertz. Uh, uh, so, you know, significantly less than, um, uh, than Ghana. But then, you know, one of the, one of the winners, Azam, actually backed out. Uh, which I, I believe is because the coverage obligations actually made it un untenable for them to, to sort of uh, plan their, their network in an affordable manner. So, um, you know, auctions, are they, uh, you know, I think they are, um, are they the right model for, um, uh, for a country like South Africa? Uh, is this auction, you know, heavily engineered? Yeah, it's, it is quite engineered to an outcome that the, the regulator wants. Would I be sorry if Casa just said, okay, you know, pay the reserve and let's get on with things? No, I think that would be fantastic, actually. I think that would be a much better outcome because auctions are, pr are prone to all sorts of, uh, uh, of uh, unfortunate outcomes. And, um, and they've tried to engineer a lot. If you look through the bidding process and the, you know, the reserves, the participation points, they really, you know, they've obviously hired experts to help design them to prevent gaming the auction. But, you know, if you look at New Zealand um, uh, earlier in the year, the 3.5 gigahertz, 
they they just said we plan to have an auction, but you know what? Just pay us the reserve prices and let's get on with this. You know, so um, and reserve prices, you know, ultimately are important. Um, uh, they, um, you know, because. First of all, as uh, Professor Martin Cave said, you know, the operators are going to be making rents on, uh, on this infrastructure, and it's perfectly reasonable that the government should have some of those rents, uh, you know, which is an argument I can, uh, you know, I'm sympathetic to. But also, you know, you want to ensure that, you know, that they have a vested interest in making use of, uh, of that spectrum and, and that reserve price is, is a good incentive. Um, where I fall down on this plan is on the coverage obligations, which are based on the uh, uh, on the German model back, I think it's 2011, uh, in 800 megahertz, and the the assumption that you must roll out to the rural areas before you can roll out to um, uh, to urban areas. Germany is just such a different market than than South Africa. You know, if you look at uh, you look what was paid at auction for that, uh, you know, with five billion dollars is what the 800 megahertz band went for. That's that's 80 83 million dollars a megahertz versus a sort of you know three million dollars a megahertz we're talking here. Um, and when we talk about connecting the rest of the world, you know, we've already connected the easy half of the world to connect. And now we're faced with the difficult, you know, more sparsely populated, lower income areas to connect. This is, the, and this is what South Africa faces in connecting the unconnected. Um, and so uh, I think, you know, forcing the operators to, to build out into areas that are not gonna be economically viable for their existing models, well, it's going to lead to some discomfort. It may lead to some evasion. Or it may lead to some gaming of the outcomes. But I, I think it's going to be challenging. For me, the much more interesting space here is in uh, shared spectrum. And uh, you know, I just want to read you uh, a clause from uh, from Ofcom's awarding of 800 megahertz uh, spectrum uh, just a uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, this is uh, this is. Um, section 4.2, if anyone's interested in the award. And it says, for the avoidance of doubt, the licenses will not guarantee exclusive use of the spectrum awarded. In the future, we may grant additional authorizations to allow the use of all or part of the spectrum, including the spectrum that is the subject of this award process. We would develop and consult on the conditions of use under any such additional authorizations in order to manage the risk of harmful interference. So in that case, you're not guaranteeing exclusivity, you're guaranteeing protection from interference, which is a much more sensible way to grant a, a spectrum license. And in that manner, then you can begin to negotiate. I mean, there, there are so many interesting country, uh, companies on the continent, Africa mobile networks that specialize in low cost infrastructure who would love to have access to this spectrum. And you have great incentives um, uh, structures, you know, such as, I think it's in the United Emirates, Arab Emirates, where instead of having coverage obligations, um, they, they designated underserved areas. And for every underserved area the operator served, the, they got a rebate on what they paid. Um, and why that's interesting for me is, is that you could offer that rebate to anybody, not just the operator. So that, I mean, or, or sorry, offer the opportunity to serve that area mm -hmm. to anyone. And then the operator gets the rebate on what they paid on, uh, on Spectrum. So there's an incentive for the incumbent. They get some of their money back from what they auction. And there's an, uh, there's an opportunity for a smaller player who doesn't have to pay for access to the Spectrum and uh, who can you know, deliver a rural access business model um, you know, that is different from the kind of uh, you know, uh, economics of, of high density urban use. Anyway, I just think, I think that's for me. If I had to pick one spot, you know, where I think there was a missed opportunity, there it's in shared spectrum in the offering. Interesting, because you, know, you have to wait five years now. In five years, I mean, oh. five years we'll have a new government. We'll have a new. Everyone will have, you know, forgotten who to blame. You know, the uh, <laughs> it's uh, you know it's it'll be too late. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, fascinating, uh, fascinating. Can story. I jump in there on, on the shared spectrum issue? Of course, please do. Yeah, so I work with an outfit called Policy Impact Partners. And last year, we 
did some research on shear spectrum in three markets, South Africa, Malaysia, and Colombia. And we focused on South Africa because the existing regulation, radio, radio frequency spectrum regs, allow spectrum sharing. But when we asked the CASA how many spectrum sharing arrangements they've approved, they said none. No one has approached them to share spectrum, although the provision has been there for several years now. And we tried to understand why this wasn't so. And you have to look at what has happened in South Africa. We have two, basically two national mobile networks and the other four licensees with Spectrum, they just haven't de um, deployed national networks. So it could be an economic issue. How are we sure that this wouldn't be perpetrated now? So we can put the obligations, how they've been done now, outside in, but it would still be on the same two. What happened to the Spectrum that was assigned previously that is sitting there unused and as Steve said, we could have smaller entities using that spectrum and it's something CASA needs to look at. Not just the spectrum that is being, that is the subject of this auction, but all of the spectrum. So dynamic access to spectrum. And if, I, if I could just come in briefly on that, I mean, the, the ITA mentions, you know, the idea that the sort of goal of having five national competing operators. I mean, for me, that is frankly mythological, uh, you know, that, you know, what we see across markets is, is a kind of condensing of national operators as opposed to an expansion of them. You know, there mo most countries cannot sustain five infrastructures not, not even three infrastructures in many cases. You know, the UK has basically got, you know, four operators, but two infrastructures or maybe three in some cases. Um, so, you know, is that, is that the most effective way to, you know, to assume that there will be, you know, five national operators? Or do we need a more complementary model that allows for two or three national operators and then smaller models, uh, smaller operators who gain access to spectrum in this kind of more more uh, dynamic way. But uh, the idea that there will be five, the, a rollout of five operators, you know, that you will be able to choose from five operators anywhere in South Africa, I just, you know, I'm frankly skeptical. Non nonsensical. But uh, let, let's ex since we're on the subject, let's let's delve a little bit deeper into the obligations that are contained in the ITA. Um, Karen, maybe I can bring you in here. Uh, let's let's go through some of these. Um, firstly, there are throughput obligations that are being placed on operators, so guaranteed minimum upload and download speeds offered nationally by a certain period. Um, does that make sense to include that in the ITA, or would competition naturally determine or, or sort that out? Duncan, there's actually been some throughput targets in SA Connect, so since 2013. Um, they were targets, not obligations. Um, and it's quite likely that most operators already exceed that. I'm not 100% sure, but uh, putting it in as an obligation is, is perhaps overkill, particularly when, as Steve said, the coverage obligations are fairly onerous. Because even if your tier one and tier, um, your MTN and Vodacom operators can achieve those speeds, They've, you know, they've they've had a sort of um, head start on the infrastructure development, and they've certainly managed to scale up um, as a result. I'm not sure that that every operator that receives spectrum and and this opt-in theoretical licensee, um, it seems like that could be a difficult um, thing for them to manage at the same time as as meeting their coverage obligations. So I'm not sure if if that's going to work particularly well. I'm not sufficiently technically clued up to know whether that, um, that's an easy thing to achieve. And as I say, perhaps the, the bigger operators already have achieved that. But I think when you take all the obligations together, mm. I think that's, uh, that's a fairly onerous ask of all the licensees. Yeah, it's coverage, for the world. throughput. They, they also have the same obligation. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mortimer, what, are you, what is your take on the obligations related specifically to the Spectrum ITA? Do you think that they're, they are onerous, um, specifically if you look at uh, things like throughput, things like coverage requirements for the various bands that have been on the 
to put on the table here? So, as Karen mentioned, the obligations, they're probably trying to mirror the targets in the SA Connect policy. Mm -hmm. So there, it's increased targets. It starts at five, then increases to 10 megabits per second, then 100, and then one gig. So ICASA, is just, it's just mm -hmm. static, five megabits per second. So from that sense, I think it's fair to have those obligations. And yeah, I don't think there'll be any complaints from the operators. They're probably exceeding those already. Already. Yes. Right. And the coverage obligations, do you think they're fair? Well, if you look at what their coverage is currently, most, well, the two main operators, they're already in the 90s, 90% 90 and more on 3G. On 4G LTE, they're 80 something percent. So it wouldn't take them much to, to meet this target. Yeah. So it may it may sound onerous, but it's not going to take them much. And once they have the additional sub one gigahertz spectrum, the 800 megahertz spectrum, that's good for coverage. Then they can meet it fairly easily. But it's the new new entrance. If, if a new player comes in and participates in this auction, someone from left field like Francis Orange, for example, decides it wants to enter the market, which I don't think is going to happen, but let's assume it did. They, they, they would actually have a lot more difficulty because of these, um, these rollout obligations that are set out in this ITA than would the incumbents MTN and Vodacom. Am I reading that correctly, Mortimer? Yes, they will, they will have difficulty because they'll be starting from scratch unless they roam for a certain period, roam on the existing network while they build out their own network. Mm. Okay. And then, um, Steve, you spoke about the um, South Africa and most markets around the world not being able to sustain more than two or three infrastructure providers. Um, CASA specifically in this ITA, and they did the same in the 2016 ITA, uh, is talking about the um, the creation, uh, the support of MVNOs as part of the licensing process. I forget what the the, the new draft of, or the, the final version of the ITA says on MVNOs specifically. Um, but um, what, what is your take on this MVNO requirement that the the big operators, the big licensees who get access to Spectrum, uh, be required to support the MVNO environment? Um. You know, MVNOs have been successful uh, in um, in North American markets and European markets. They they create you know a I think more robust competition. They cater to different uh, demographics. Um, I think it's trickier though in a uh, country like South Africa where there is less margin, right, and where the the uh, the the people you you know, the unserved uh, are unlikely to be served by M MVNOs simply because, you know, the margins there are, there's not really that en enough play for a, an MVNO to, to make a go of it. So there may be MVNOs in, in urban markets, so, you know, catering to, you know, to a, na a fairly narrow demographic, but I don't see MVNOs as a kind of a strategic tool for affordable access for all, certainly. Okay. Karen? Can I come uh, in there? Um, yeah, yeah, just go ahead and ask your question. Maybe it's the same as what I was going to say. No, please go, please go ahead with your thought. Um, the M on the MBNO side, there are quite a number of MBNOs operating, but they're all hosted currently by Cell C. Yes. There aren't any MBNOs hosted by MTN and Vodacom. Um, and although Cell C hosts as many as it can possibly take, the ITA asks that all MVNOs be 51% black owned. So that might make it more difficult um, for the operators. And I, I don't even know if this is a, compl a compliance issue, if that's going to be a license condition, which it seems that it is going to be, or if it's just a, a recommendation that you should try and take on at least five. But I think for each winner, to find five 51% black owned MBNOs could be difficult if that's what's intended. Interesting. What well, you've, you've touched on, on BE requirements in-, in, uh, in uh, Duncan, I Duncan, before you jump, move to B, could I jump in there on the well, MVN, can, please go ahead. on the obligation? Yeah, so we have the open access obligations on the tier one licensees. And I'm, I'm a bit, 
I'm not sure what it means because it says site access. And that's not what I thought the obligation should be, the open access obligation. Not just restricted to site access. So an MVNO may not want access to the site, they just want capacity. Yes. But the way it's written currently, it's only site access. It, and I think it's in section 12 mm. of the ITA, 12.3 open access obligation. I know the big operators were quite concerned about these open access obligations that were, were being discussed. Um, what in your view, Mortimer, should the, should the ITA be saying about open access, if anything at all? So yes, you would need access to the site, to the, uh, and also to capacity. So an MVNO could, sharing, could take many different forms. It could be sharing of the core network or some elements of the core network, or even all the way to RAN sharing the radio access network. What the CASA seems to be doing is pushing, they're seeking to define what shape the sharing should take. And I don't think they should do that. They should leave it up to market forces. I obviously have a very different understanding of what an MBNO is. I mean, my understanding is that, I mean, a virtu it's a, a virtual network virtual. operator that yeah. wouldn't have any access at all to, to any physical infrastructure, but they offer a kind of, you know, branded service that, 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 that specializes in, you know, to, to a specific demographic and a, a specific kind of constituency. That is generally um, what the, the MBNO model is in South Africa. Um, there's a category defined in the Electronic Communications Act as resellers. And a reseller would really take capacity from an operator and then rebrand it and reprice it and then make it available. So Steve, your, your understanding in the South African context is correct. I know the UK many, many, many moons ago when there was still Ofttel, not even Ofcom, did a consultation on what MVNOs could be. And they did say that there would be multiple levels, that you could simply buy capacity or that you could even go up to a sort of national roaming stage where you'd have your own billing infrastructure. Um, but ICASA hasn't given any guidance. Um, and I think most people or most entities that are MVNOs don't want to have to get a license. So they tend to veer away from owning and operating their own infrastructure. So possibly something that requires uh, uh, explaining in that uh, explanatory document that you uh, proposed at the beginning, Karen. Um, I, I wanted to touch on, uh, uh, while I'm with you, Karen, I wanted to touch on the BE requirements in the ITA. What do they, what do they state specifically and um, what is your take on those, on those conditions? Uh, it's fairly interesting and in fact it's more interesting in the WOAN context, but um, one of the conditions that will be imposed on winning bidders is that within 12 months, they achieve, uh, I think that's a 51%, um, I think it's a 51% requirement. Um, so a level be, one BE requirement. Um, I, I didn't see yeah. a 51, but I may, I may have missed that. Yeah, it's level one. So if you look at, I think it's section 14.2. So within 12 months of being issued with a radio frequency license, uh, the licensee must reach a level one contributor status in terms of the um, ICT sector code. And that's over and above the pre-qualification requirements. So the act currently in section 92B, uh, which has been the subject of massive controversy over the years, says a 30% HDI equity ownership. And HDI is very broadly defined, far more broadly defined than BEE or such other threshold as ICASA may define in terms of the ICASA Act. That's actually what that section says. And ICASA did last year, I think, or it might even have been in 2018, consult widely on what the appropriate ownership and control um, position should be for licensees. And it did ask the question, should they adopt the code word for word, or should they keep with the ECA and just find some sort of middle ground? And there were widely varied um, responses, extremely widely varying responses. And ICASA hasn't yet come out with a, a final regulation in that regard. So it's, um, 
it's pretty tough. The woe and one, just to touch briefly on that without going into any um, specifics, but the woe and one has three obligations. You've got to have uh, a certain percentage of female um, black women, I think it is, um, owners. You've got to have 30% HDI and you have to have 51% black ownership. And the way that it's phrased in the document, it looks like they're cumulative. In, or, well, they certainly aren't phrased in the alternative. So it's not, uh, it's not clear to me exactly how that would work um, in practice. Well, 20, it's 20% black female, I think, if I remember correctly, 30% HDI, 51% black, the total is 101%. Yes. So I'm not sure if they're suggesting that if you have 51%, you'll qualify. If you have 30% HDI, you'll qualify. And if you have 20% female owned, you'll qualify. The way that it's written, it could be all three of them. But the, certainly the, the requirements for the ITA are a minimum of 30% HDI, and then that's within 12 months, it's 51% black owned. And do you know offhand whether the big operators that are going to participate in this process, um, I'm thinking specifically MT and Vodacom Telcom, are sufficiently empowered to be able to take part? Uh, they, in the past, there's been some question marks over whether or not they even comply with 30% HDI requirement. And I don't know if you recall, but um, 2016 or so when Vodacom attempted to buy Neotel, as it then was, yes. uh, there was a the court case and one of the issues was that ICASA said to Vodacom off the books as it were that they could over time reach the 30% requirement whereas the act stipulates that you must come before ICASA with your 30% um, um, threshold already met. So ICASA I think has given the operators some grace period to achieve 30% Hmm. Um, and I don't know whether or not they have yet achieved that um, as, as MTN and Vodacom. I think CELC achieved it some time ago, but I don't know about MTN and Vodacom. Yeah, and Telcom well, is one I'm specifically interested in, because I, I think they, they don't meet these requirements. They've got themselves excluded, if I remember correctly. I think there's an amendment to um, one of the schedules yeah. of the, um, that allows them to be excluded from the definition. Steve, you wanted to say something? No, it was me. <laughs> oh, sorry, Mortimer. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so I'm looking at it from a slightly different viewpoint. So we've had the Triple B Act for about 16 years now. And if the companies were serious about complying, they should have complied by now. So to cry that it's too onerous, I don't really buy that. Having said that, I think they already comply with level one. Yes. At least the large operators. Yes. So again, I don't think it would be an issue, but if it was, I wouldn't have much sympathy mm -hmm. for them. Right. Okay. All right. Let's let's move on a bit. Um, and Steve, let me bring you back into the conversation here. I want to talk specifically about the digital dividend bands. So again, the 700 megahertz and 800 megahertz bands. Uh, South Africa is in a in a uniquely bad situation, if I can put it that way, and that we have not finished our digital broadband, broadcast digital migration project, which we uh, were supposed to, I think the government originally committed to completing that project around 2010 or 2011. Uh, we then missed the 2015 deadline, uh, which, which we agreed to with the International Telecommunication Union uh, to complete it, and now we're five years beyond that, and we're still nowhere near completing this project, and uh, I had an interview with the acting DG in the Department of Communications the other day who said that we're unlikely to complete this much before 2022. Um, Steve, ICASA is licensing, planning to license Spectrum through this auction process for, uh, the, um, for the digital dividend bands. Um, is it jumping the gun here? Should we actually be including these two bands in this licensing process, given how far behind we are with digital migration? No, I don't think so. I, I think, um, well, I mean, I, I don't think South Africa is completely unique. The uh, digital switchover has been a slow moving train wreck on the continent uh, across many countries. And I mean, uh, it's a kind of classic example of where 
uh, technology has outpaced regulation. So, you know, the decision was taken in 2005 for the digital switchover, for the, you know, uh, offering it, you know, I think it was about nine years or 10 years, which you, everything would be complete. But, you know, that decision was taken before the, before the invention of the smartphone. Hmm. It, it was taken before the, before Netflix. Well, actually Netflix existed, but, but they, they, um, their, their chief delivery mechanism was, uh, you know, the U.S. Postal Service and DVDs. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, they, and now, you know, we see, you know, the, the, the sort of steamroller that is, you know, streaming media, um, whether it's Netflix or here or Iroku in, in uh, Nigeria. I mean, they're, you know, uh, this is shifting ground and to try and hold back, you know, the assignment of, you know, extremely valuable IMT spectrum based on, on waiting for that to happen, I think is, uh, would be a mistake. I think, you know, it, it will be good because, you know, the, any spectrum awardee is going to step up the pressure for, uh, you know, for the completion of the, um, of the switchover. Interesting. So, yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I, you know, I just, uh, yeah, I think you just can't wait. Steve, do you think we should? Uh, do you think we should give up on digital TV? Should we just scrap it and go direct to home satellite? Free up all the spectrum for broadband. Um, look, I think um, I think broadcast is an important medium, and it's 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 politically important as well as economically important. But there are many ways of broadcasting. Uh, so you know, satellite is. Uh, as an increasingly important uh, medium in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the delivery of broadcast. Um, streaming media can actually become a, you know, a broadcast medium. I would certainly, you know, um, you know, giving up on it's a strong word as millions and millions and millions of dollars have been invested. Uh, but I would certainly make my aspirations of it as modest as possible. Mm -hmm. I think that is how I would describe it. Okay. Um, Karen, oh, yeah. Yes, Mortimer. So on, on the spectrum issue, the digital dividend, it's a situation where even though we have not completed the digital migration, the spectrum in various areas is still, some spectrum is still available for use. And we have a precedent with the 1800 megahertz band where it was licensed to the various MNOs, although we still had the government services in there. They had not migrated fully. And there was a workaround. So okay. it's possible, yeah. So we've done it before in South Africa. Everyone knows about that. Mm. So it's not something unique. Okay. It's interesting, a uh, coexistence of, of both um, broadband providers and uh, television uh, broadcasters. Um, I, I know MTN made some comments uh, just a couple of weeks ago saying that they found it quite difficult to um, to coexist with the broadcasters because they picked up a lot of interference issues. So I'm not sure to what extent um, they're going to be able to use those digital dividend bands once they've been allocated. But um, Karen, uh, we, we spoke about the um, relatively high reserve prices, um, particularly in the 800 megahertz band. How happy, how happy are um, participants in the spectrum auction process going to be uh, to pay those uh, fees, those reserve prices, if they won't have full access to that spectrum for at least a couple of years? I think that's a very valid point. And it was debated um, during, I think, two previous drafts of uh, an information memorandum that ICASA put out for, for comment. And I think the general feeling was that you should not have to pay or the payment should be deferred until such time as the bands were actually freed up. And ICASA hasn't, uh, unless I've missed it, I don't see that ICASA has addressed that yeah, it's, it's before you get awarded the spectrum and the license is issued to you, the price that is bid um, and certainly the reserve price, if that's what people end up paying and not bidding, um, has to be paid. So it's possible that the CASA will allow for some negotiation. Mm -hmm. um, I know they did that when they issued the CELC license. There was some negotiation then on the terms and conditions and payment and so on. But the ITA doesn't make it clear that that is going to be possible here. So I would be I would be somewhat reluctant to have to pay on award if I can't immediately access the spectrum. Yeah, 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 indeed. If 
if uh, if memory serves, the there is a provision around the license period that relates to this, and that the the licenses are issued for twenty years, but there is some wording that says that you know that uh, that period begins at the availability of the spectrum. Oh. I think that was a reference to the the seven hundred and eight hundred megahertz oh. band. So okay. at least that there is that provision that that you you won't it, you know the clock doesn't start ticking on your license. But uh, as to the payment, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, interesting. I actually missed that part of the ITA. So thanks for that, Steve. Now, um, before we move on to the one, and I am conscious of time, we are over an hour, so I'm not, not going to keep you guys too much longer. But um, I, I was just curious about, um, and I think Mortimer raised, it may have been Steve, I think it was Mortimer, uh, who, who raised the question about why uh, ICASA didn't, um, decided to remove 2.3 gigahertz from this uh, auction. We had five bands before, now it's down to four, 2.3 gigahertz has been removed. Karen, any uh, insight into why they, they might, ICASA might have decided to do that? I think ICASA themselves have explained it as as uh, them feeling like they need to uh, award it in a subsequent process, in a different process. So I think they've said that it uh, proved difficult to structure the lots at the moment. And uh, it may be that there are occupiers of that band that they need to move out. Because I know Liz, uh, Sorry, Telcom, Telcom is in there, yeah. they've got 60 megahertz, I think. Yeah, they were going to migrate some people into different bands. Neotel at one stage, I don't know if it's still the case with Liquid, mm. but they were also going to have to be migrated. I'm not sure if it's the same band, but they have mentioned in the document that it is their intention to award it, but yep. in a separate process. So, Steve, what is 2.3 gigahertz typically used for? Um, 2.3 is, uh, is a great um, digital-only access band. Right, and that's what telecom have been using it for. So, you know, uh, typically, uh, you know, dongles, right? So, you know, kind of MiFi devices, uh, fantastic for that. It makes it, e you know, it's a great band for a new operator uh, because, uh, you know, they don't have to engage in the whole sort of handset ecosystem necessarily. They can, they can push uh, data dongles and market themselves as a kind of high-speed digital access, which is like kind of, I think, what... Um, what telecom have been doing. Um, and of course it is TDD spectrum. So it is, you know, um, sort of optimized for, um, uh, for download. And, you know, that's roughly what we've seen other 2.3 gigahertz uh, operators uh, doing elsewhere on the continent. I think it's quite, you know, it's quite an appealing band from that, from that point of view. And um, it, it is a little weird to have left it out when we include it, when, you know, when you include 2.6 and 3.5, it's definitely part of that same family and it is a, a bit weird for it to be excluded, I think. Mm, interesting. Mortimer, um, we're going to move on to the discussion about the WOAN next and uh, you've kindly agreed to um, excuse yourself from that part of the discussion uh, because of uh, any potential conflicts. Uh, but before we say goodbye to you, any final thoughts from your side on this whole process? Well, as I said in the beginning, I think ICASA should be congratulated. They've made progress and it's better to get this going, conclude it, rather than focus too much on the many issues that are not perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, Mortimer, for joining us. Mortimer, I hope uh, you're in uh, Gu Guyana. Am I saying that correctly? You're in uh, Guyana. Guyana. British Guyana in South America, um, yeah. and uh, you are the, um, yeah, I've lost your title, MD of GH Communications, and I look forward to hopefully hearing more about your uh, plans uh, with the new and your um, participation in that uh, in the coming weeks and months. But Mortimer, thanks so much for joining us. You're welcome, to, of course, to stay on the call, but if I could ask you to, uh, to mute your microphone, um, we're going to continue with the conversation with uh, Steve and Karen just for a few moments longer to talk about a little bit in very brief uh, uh, terms uh, about the Wholesale Open Access Network. Uh, Karen, let me bring you back in here. Um, what's your take on the WOAN ITA in broad terms? And uh, do you think that um, it's uh, set up for success or failure? I think we're all forgetting to unmute half the time. Um, Duncan, oh, golly. I, I, I feel a little bit sorry for WOAN applicants. Um, some of the provisions seem to have been cut and pasted from the IMT ITA. So some of the obligations on the WOAN seem to be identical to those that would be imposed on existing operators, and particularly with those that have had 
so-called COVID spectrum, if you will, since April, yes. they would have been able to test out um, the spectrum, maybe look at the design of their network, certainly look at device acquisition and that sort of thing. And the poor old Wohen gets to come in now and it's subject to the same rollout obligations and coverage obligations. And a couple of the documents that they have to submit with their application are really detailed documents. Um, their business plan, obviously, they, uh, and then their technical plan. But their technical plan is, as far as I can tell, identical in every respect to a technical plan of an existing operator that's going to acquire Spectrum. So even to the extent of, of mentioning sites that they've acquired, devices that they've had type approved or network equipment that they've had type approved, they need to submit the certificates. Those things would be really quite expensive for a Wohen, I think, to have in place. They need to have negotiated all their roaming and interconnection and facilities leasing agreements already. They need to have registered a company. So although ICASA says that a consortium of persons could mm. make an application, it's clear from the application form where they ask for company registration numbers and a detailed analysis of shareholding and you have to provide your share certificates that they actually expect this to be an incorporated registered entity. Mm. So that's quite a lot of, um, maybe not a massive amount of expense, but it's quite a lot of trouble um, to go through because there are all sorts of associated CIPC requirements and compliance issues. Um, and you don't even know if you're going to be successful in the bid. Then, of course, as we mentioned earlier, there's the ownership requirements, and they don't seem to get 800 megahertz spectrum, as far as I can tell. The lot that's been reserved to the WOA and doesn't include 800. So the, the, those are sort of the negatives. I mean, on, on the plus side, um, there is this 30% offtake um, obligation on, on winners of IMT spectrum, but I've already seen a number of posts on social media asking how that's going to be calculated. And although ICASA does say it's proportionate to the spectrum mm. that gets awarded in the auction, it's also quite difficult on day one, it will be 30% of nothing. On day 670, it might be 30% of something. Mm. So is it 30% at any given time? And how does one calculate that? If ICASA was to ask each operator, are you taking off your proportionate 12% share out of 30% share on a given day, they would have to know exactly what the WOAN is producing on that day. Yeah. So it's, um, I think some of the things, again, would benefit from some clarification. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Steve, um, in your uh, experience of the global telecommunications industry, do you think, um, I, I mean, I don't know of any successful WOANs. I think uh, Mexico has tried it. I think Rwanda was going to try it and then abandoned it. I think Russia was going to try it and abandoned it. Have there been any successful examples of WOANs around the world? And uh, do you think South Africa is going to get it right? Well, um, so uh, let me, let's start by saying that, um, that there have been many successful examples of wholesale networks. Right. Right. You know, so wholesale fiber networks have proven, you know, um, very, very successful in terms of um, uh, un unlocking markets, uh, stimulating competition. I think if you look at the example of, uh, you know, C squared in Kampala or in Accra, uh, you know, it has been a critical move in terms of layer separation, even telecom. Uh, I think, you know, that has uh, that has been a very beneficial move. So wholesale networks, uh, in principle, mm -hmm. I think are a very good idea. Um, the devil's in the details. Um, so, uh, so a wholesale network was uh, implemented in Rwanda. It's still operating, as far as I know. So that was Korea Telecom, that's uh, Ole uh, Korea Telecom that operates that. But, I mean, they, the, you know, the chief problem they face is the fact that the, it's too expensive for anyone to to buy capacity from right. them so you know that's that's one of the you know how do you address that uh, in the context of the world and how do you ensure that the prices are low enough that the, you know that the operators will will want to buy 30 percent or more from them and so you know and the history of regulators regulating the price of wholesale networks that's 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 a little more of a dodgy um a dodgy road, um, and then you know in Mexico um, the um, the wholesale network uh, you know they, they they set aside the whole of the seven hundred megahertz band, um, and um, and they did it as a separate entity, right? So it was a one time seven hundred megahertz band going to a wholesale network, 
And, you know, giving, I think the network a huge leg up, right? So it's, if you want access to this band, here's the only way you're going to get it. Yeah. And, um, uh, and it was done, it wasn't done with another auction, you know, it was done as an independent activity. Has it been a success? Um, in terms of rolling out into underserved areas? No, because, mm-hmm. you know, they want to they want to <laughs> recoup their investment as well. So, you know, as a, a what problem is the WAN going to solve? Um, you know, I, it, it faces the same challenges as the existing operators. And the fact that a lot of spectrum is going up for grabs at the same time as the WAN is going to make it even tougher for them. Now, ICASA have tried to, to sort of, you know, uh, militate against that by, by bringing in the, the 30% requirement. But anytime you force someone to, to buy your product, you are creating, I don't know, a, 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 an un- unhealthy tension and that you really want, you know, the product to, to sell itself, you know, because it's affordable and, and people want to buy access to it. So yeah. the, the opportunity for things going wrong, I think, is, is not small. Yeah, it's, it sounds to me like we might be actually creating a, a regulatory monster here and uh, possibly distorting the market. Well, the interesting thing for me will be to see whether there's actually a successful bidder. I mean, as Karen pointed out, I think this is <laughs> pretty tough because it's going to be a you know a new entity. And 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 let's face it, in every market, incumbents have a massive advantage. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, yeah, I, as as a as a going concern, I think it's 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 going to be pretty impressive attempt by anyone who 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 bids on that on that wholesale network yeah yeah so kudos to you mortimer i'm just saying mortimer <laughs> sweating in the background there he's uh, offline but uh, 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 uh Karen, sure ways around these things <laughs> <laughs> i was going to ask is it possible to do horse trading we know that remgro stated they are possibly keen to get involved in the wom um is you know is this ita set in stone or is there a possibility that there could be horse trading over some of these conditions well, again, it's not entirely clear that um, ICAS is going to allow negotiation. Uh, it's not unusual um, in these situations to allow some negotiation, but it's got a long list of things that you need to be compliant with failing, which you are disqualified. So well, I think they don't even consider your bid if you're not compliant with some of the things. So it, it seems more loaded on the side of compliance than it does on the side of we can chat about this. Right. Um, so I'm, I think it's, again, slightly unfortunate, maybe you cast didn't mean it that way, but I, I do think it comes across as fairly set in stone. And of course, there have been policies and policy directions about the Warren for so long um, that ICASA may feel that it's been sufficiently well aired it's just that the um, the result, as it appears in, in this ITA, is perhaps not that flexible. Yeah. I just wanted to mention on Steve's point, though, I think competition is going to be a, a real issue for the WAN mm. because they're only operating at the wholesale level. But you've already got an obligation on the other operators to take on board MVNOs and to make access available to, to third parties. So they're already going to be competing with these incumbents. Hmm. And as we know from history, um, ICASA has intended to give new entrants much protection, if I can put it like that. Um, It's sometimes more common to give um, new entrants a leg up um, from a regulatory point of view, but it hasn't happened much in the past in our regulatory framework. Do you think the 30% offtake, as well as the fact that the WAN won't have to participate in the auction, it'll go through a uh, a regular licensing process with it, we would won't presumably pay huge spectrum fees. Do you think that is um, sufficient or insufficient to be able to support it? Uh, uh, in my personal view, is it's not sufficient, but I do think it, it it goes some way to making it attractive. Certainly, they've also said they can delay the payment of the fee for the first seven years. Um, you know, there is this offtake obligation. They have said that um, operators who win Spectrum on the IMT auction must make a reference access offer, offer available for site access. Um, and they are supposed to be, or they were going to, ECASA was going to regulate national roaming. Mm-hmm. But funny enough, that doesn't appear uh, from this document. So it may be their intention separately. Um, and all those things are, are extremely helpful to a new entrant. 
But I think there are some things which are possibly still somewhat limiting. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, before we before we wrap, this has been a fascinating discussion. Um, I want to maybe just ask a bit of a technical question to Steve around the WOAN. Um, it's um, Picasso is going to assign uh, eighty megahertz of spectrum in total to the WOAN, twenty megahertz of which is at seven hundred megahertz, thirty megahertz at two point six gigahertz, and thirty megahertz again at three point five gigahertz. Is that sufficient, uh, Steve, to build a national wholesale network and deliver both three G, both four G? and 5G wireless services? I think so. Uh, you know, I think the, I mean, you know, it all depends on um, on cell density in terms of, you know, what it costs you to to roll out sufficient capacity, but it's a, it's, it's quite a, a chunk of spectrum. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, 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 it seems like a plausible amount to me. All right. I mean, if I can add just one 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 point about the world, and I think it, it was it's worth looking at what has recently happened in the UK in terms of coverage obligations that were going to be imposed by Ofcom, and the incumbents came back collectively and proposed an alternative where they would form a consortium to to uh, to deliver access. I think you know there's an opportunity here. For the incumbents to, you know, to put their heads together and say, you know, well, you know, we're we're interested in the wholesale network, and here's how you could do it in a way that would actually, you know, help our businesses and 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 help the market as a whole. I think uh, there's, you know, we're at a moment where, you know, some creative thought uh, might be welcome. Interesting, and I, I think that um, I think that the, the danger here is that Icasa is too rigid in in uh, sticking to the rules of the ITA and not al- allowing different views to come in. Because I think there may be um, potential bidders here who come in and say to Icasa, "Well, this isn't going to work, chaps. You're going to have to change this and this and this if you want us to participate in this." Um, Karen, let me leave you the fi- final thought. Any f- um, final views on this whole process? Now that we've uh, spent the last hour and twenty minutes talking about it, what what would you like to see? happen next? Um, what are some of the big uh, issues we should watch out for in the weeks and months ahead? And I think that, um, I think that, well, perhaps the cast has been watching this podcast um, and perhaps they will just give some thought to maybe entering into discussion or some sort of clarification or maybe some guidance on how they intend this to apply. Um, one can always um, put something in writing which is slightly different from what one intended Uh, to be read. Um, And I think that would be helpful. I think there are some things here which maybe don't reflect some of the uh, submissions that have been made over the past number of years, including when the ECA was going to be amended, because that amendment would have foreseen a whole chapter devoted to the WOAN. So there has been a lot of discussion over the years on how the WOAN should operate and and what it should all be about. Mm -hmm. So it would be, it would, I think, be a very positive thing if ICASA would engage with stakeholders. They don't have to withdraw the ITA, but maybe some guidance on what they meant or or how things might be um, managed would be helpful. Thank you, everyone. This has been a fascinating discussion. I really appreciate you taking the time out uh, this afternoon to to unpack all of this. And I have no doubt that uh, there's going to be a a, a huge amount of discussion on this, on both of these ITAs in the weeks and months ahead. And uh, look forward to reading all the submissions, et cetera, et cetera. Karen Edmondson. um, Karen, if if people want to find out a bit more about you, I know you have a website. What is the address again? It's www.karenedmondson.co.za. There we go. It's easy. As easy as that. And uh, Steve, uh, Steve has an excellent blog. If you don't uh, subscribe to it or read it, you should. Um, he uh, he doesn't produce a lot of uh, articles on on that blog, but uh, when he does, it's always well worth reading. I've uh, got you subscribed in my RSS, Steve, and uh, uh, read uh, everything that uh, you produce when you do. And that website is um, manypossibilities.net. Is that right? Dot net. That's correct. Yes. Dot- .net. And uh, if you want to have a look at that uh, undersea cable map, which I mentioned at the beginning, um, you'll find that on that website as well. But uh, all of you, Mortimer Hope, who joined us for the first three quarters of the conversation, Karen Edmondson and Steve Song, thanks so much for talking to Tech Central today.